Brothers and sisters, it's good to be with you. It's a joy to have an opportunity to open up God's Word. Would you turn in God's Word to Psalm 2? Turn to a very famous psalm and one that is, I think, of great encouragement. Let's hear the reading of God's most holy, His most powerful, His inspired, uh, His infallible, and His inerrant Word. Psalm 2. And as you hear this psalm, you can think about that persecution in China long ago. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. And the ends of the earth, your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Brothers and sisters, you remember just a few months back uh, the American evacuation or withdrawal from Afghanistan. In an article written just around that time uh, entitled The Americans Staying in Afghanistan, Jen Oshman writes the following. Every time President Biden and Press Secretary Jim Psaki talk about the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, they refer to the evacuating Americans as those who want to leave Afghanistan. Now on the surface that seems like an odd description. Don't all Americans want to leave Afghanistan? Who wants to stay in a place where the Taliban are figuring out what it looks like to rule again? She continues, no American wants to stay in a country overrun with terrorists. But there are indeed Americans who want to stay in Afghanistan. She says, I don't know how many and I don't know the story of each one, but there are more who want to stay there than you might think. Why? Because they love God and they love Afghans. Because they love God and they love Afghans. She continues, these are missionaries who've already counted the cost. They've left home, family, comfort, and security well before the U.S. decided to evacuate. Many have been there since before the U.S. military even arrived. They've been all in for years, and they have no intention of coming back now. They will live out their days sharing the love of God, sharing the love of Christ in a very dark place. Many Americans are sure that all Americans want to live in America. But many American Christians have answered Jesus' call to go and make disciples of all nations. They are convinced that Jesus, who has all authority on heaven and on earth, is with them until the very end. And they believe there's no more worthwhile way to spend their days than to preach Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again to the people of Afghanistan. And they know they're in grave danger. They know they could be martyred. And they believe it's worth it. If not them, then who? How are Afghans to call the one they have not believed in? And how are they to believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them. She continues, several years ago, a friend of of our friends, a young aid worker, was killed by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Violence at the time 
by the Taliban have been increasing in her region. And both her sending agency and the State Department were urging all American aid workers to leave the country. Her response, get this, her response at the time was this, please do not make me leave Afghanistan. It will kill me if I have to leave. Please don't make me leave Afghanistan. It will kill me if I have to leave. She intended to give her all, all her remaining days, to providing medical relief and the gospel to Afghans. And one day, sure enough, a Taliban terrorist came into the clinic in which she was working with a gun hidden under a fake bandage, and he opened fire. And he killed many aid workers, including her. He would later say this, in his own words, if they kept doing what they were doing, then the whole country would believe in Jesus. He had to do it. If they kept doing what they were doing, the whole country would believe in Jesus. And that's why, brothers and sisters, there are Americans who don't want to leave Afghanistan. And that's why Biden and Psaki really did have to qualify their statements each time. There really are Christians from America and elsewhere who want to stay. Why? Because they want the whole country to believe in Jesus. Amen? And as as amazing and as challenging as such missionary stories are, what in the world do they have to do with Psalm 2? Everything. They have everything to do with Psalm 2. Or more pointedly, I think these stories reveal the type of spirit that is needed to understand this psalm. And I believe these, these sorts of stories best understand and best reflect the spirit that's produced by the Holy Spirit in the heart of believers through this psalm. When we come to the psalm, typically, I think we often come to it wrongly, or at least inadequately. This is what I mean. We know of an ungodly evil government or an ungodly evil tyrant that is doing or threatening terrible things. Brothers and sisters, I've been on many trips, mission trips to Kiev, Ukraine. i got a lot of friends in Ukraine right now. And right now, when I come to Psalm 2, Putin and his army right on the border of Ukraine are right up here in my mind. And I'll come to Psalm 2 and I'll come with it and to it with an attitude that goes like this. Yeah, Putin, one day you're going to get it. One day you're going to get it. And it's true, despisers of God and persecutors of God's church will only be allowed to shake their fist at the Almighty but for a time, a limited time. If they don't kiss the sun, judgment is coming. I mean, after all, where are the Neros and the Caligulas and the Hitlers and the Stalins of the world today? That is a part of the psalm. They will not be allowed to shake their fists forever. And we're going to come to that sort of aspect of the psalm in a bit. But that's not all to this text. And if you just come to this text, to Psalm 2, with a yeah, you're going to get it sort of attitude, you'll miss the psalm. Let's call that the vindictive approach. I don't want us to have the vindictive approach. I want us to have the self-reflective approach. I want us to think about ourselves first, consider our own hearts first before we move outward to those who shake the fist at the Almighty. And as we're self-reflective, I want us to do so and be so by doing three things. I want us to look at the keys to understanding this text. I want us to look at the knowledge that I think we should gain from the text. And I want us to look at the kiss that's required by the text, the keys, the knowledge and the kiss. First of all, the keys. Now you are here at Ambassador and I know you're under the faithful ministry of God's Word from Pastor Kyle and Pastor Warren and from your various teachers. And I know as those who sit under such a wonderful ministry of the Word, you know that any Old Testament passage that you go to ultimately will point you to whom? 
Jesus Christ. And that's the first and that's the overarching key. But I think there's two additional keys you need to understand to understand this psalm. And you find them actually in the text itself. The first key I think we find in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Now, if you take Psalm 1 and you take Psalm 2 together, and they make up together the introduction to the entire Psalter, when you take Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together, Psalm 1 is really directed to us as individuals. Which way will you go? The way of righteousness and of wisdom or the way of unrighteousness and foolishness? Which congregation will you belong to? Right, And so that first psalm really does have an individual focus. Then when you move to Psalm 2, the focus is on kings and nations. It seems to be broader. And I think that is true. But we can press that distinction too far. Because, brothers and sisters, what are nations made up of? What are peoples made up of? Individuals. And so Psalm 2 also has an application not just to single kings, not just to nations as wholes, but to the individuals of those nations. So the first key is to see this psalm as speaking to us, like Psalm 1, as individuals. The second key I think we find in the imagery of verse 3. Notice it again. Let us burst their bonds apart. And cast away their cords from us. This is what the concophony of evil rulers and the nations are, are saying. Let's burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Now when you read that, it might be easy to have in your mind the picture of prisoners in shackles, in chains. The image that might come to mind is of a military victor cracking the whip, driving prisoners of war shackled to the prisoner of war camp. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't think that's the best way to understand the imagery of bonds and cords. Rather, the imagery is this. Think with me of a loving farmer who gets up early in the morning and he goes to the barn and he opens up the barn and he goes beside that mule that he has cared for tenderly since it was tiny. He pats the mule on the side and he hooks the mule up to go out and plow in the fields. That's the imagery. It's the imagery of reins, bridles, and yokes. Hear the verse again. Let's burst there. Reins, the bridles, their yokes. Let's cast away their, their reins, their bridles, their yokes from us. The imagery of reins and bridles is the imagery that you're owned. You're owned by a glorious, loving farmer, the Creator God. And these, in verse 3, hate that thought. Here are the two keys. This psalm does address you as an individual and it bears the imagery of you being owned by a sovereign God. And so that leads us to the second point. It's really a point of application in the knowledge that we should gain from it. The question is simple. Do you ever chafe? Do you ever grumble? Do you ever dislike the fact that God the Creator owns you? Not just he has ownership, sovereign ownership rights over Putin, but he has sovereign ownership rights over you. That, that his ways are the ways in which you should go and not your own. To ask, if we're honest, is to answer. By nature, we do what? By nature, we hate God and we hate his anointed. We hate the Father and we hate the Son. We hate the King. We want to be the King. We want to sit on the throne of our own hearts, right? We want our way to be the way, right? We want to be a law unto ourselves. We don't want to be owned. The kings are upset because they have an owner. We can be as well. This is the basic impulse, dear ones, of the human heart. 
one minister quoting the Scottish writer George MacDonald said that there's one conviction that's held by all who are in hell. And that one conviction is this. I am my own. The one conviction held by all in hell. I am my own. Take your nasty yoke off of me. I belong to no one but myself. I am the captain of my own soul. I am the master of my own fate. I will be what I want to be. No one has the right to tell me otherwise. I am my own. The problem is, you aren't. The problem is, I'm not. The problem is, we aren't. We have an owner. We have one who is sovereign over us. Maybe you say, well, Pastor Lee, Preacher Lee, that's just preacher talk. You know how preachers are. They just use hyperbole all the time. That's just hyperbole. I don't, I don't chafe under the yoke. I don't bristle under the thought that God owns me. Well, really? Well, try on a few divine demands, all right? Listen to just a few. And the first one, I want, I want you to think about you driving during rush hour. Ready? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Think about that person who's trying to undercut you in your job. Don't call someone a fool. Don't commit adultery in your heart. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others to be seen by them. Don't lay up for yourself treasures in... No, lay it up in heaven. Don't lay it up where? On earth. You cannot serve God and mammon, money. Try this one on for size. Every single one of us, don't be anxious about our lives. Take the log out of your own eye first. How you doing? If your response is, yes, preacher Lee, but... You're proving my point. The keys, the knowledge, now the kiss. If denying your natural chafing at the yoke is not the response to the kingship of Jesus that you should give... And if raging against him most certainly isn't, what is the proper response? What does the text itself demand? What's required? Jump down to verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, virtually every commentator, when we get to this point, they all nail it. And they basically all say the same thing. There is no refuge from the king. There is only refuge in the king. There is no refuge from the king. There is only refuge in the king. You need the king. You need to take your refuge in him before it's too late. You need to kiss the son. But what does it mean to kiss the son? Children, what does it mean? I mean, Jesus is not standing here physically. So you can't go run up and kiss him. What does it mean to kiss the Son? Well, I think it it, it at least means that you admit your sinful rebellion. Your selfish and your puny attempts to be your own king. I think it means at least that. But then one minister adds the following. And I think this is very helpful. To kiss the Son means to obey. It means to accept, it means to love, and it means to expect. Okay? It means to obey. Of course, kissing the Son means to obey. You obey Him as your King. He has rights over you. You obey Him. He's not a life coach. He's not a consultant peddling advice that you can take or leave. And if you ever treat Him like that, 
Woe be unto you. If we ever do that, woe be unto us. He is king. And as king, he is to be obeyed. It means to obey. It also means to accept. Accept his ordering of your life. If he is the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords, he knows what is best. To come to kiss the son means to accept what he has established in your life, even the dark providences, because the king knows best. And he does all that is right. And he does that which will be for your ultimate good. It means to obey. It means to accept. And it means to adore. Yes, the imagery is of kissing the son. It's the imagery of bowing down and kissing the feet of the sovereign. But brothers and sisters, it's still kissing. It's still kissing. And kissing is a sign of adoration and love. It, it, it's a sign that you're enamored with Him above and beyond all things and all people. To kiss the Son means you love the Son. Where is your heart this morning, dear one? When you think of all that the King has done for you, where's your heart? Don't you love Him? Don't you want to be enthralled with Him? Enamored with Him? I want you to think about a, a, a famous story of Jesus. You remember when He goes into the home of the Pharisee Simon. You remember that story? He goes in. And no, no sooner is he in there, this, this sinner, this woman comes rushing in. Everybody knows she's a sinner. And she comes and she does what? She just lays down and she kisses his feet, wipes his feet with her tears, anoints his feet. And the Pharisee Simon's looking on with what? Disgust. Remember what Jesus said to Simon? Simon, I have something to say to you. Do you see this woman? And Simon's thinking, everybody sees this woman. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many. He didn't have to say, you all know that. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins to kiss the Son means to obey Him. It means to accept even the dark providences that come from His hand, knowing that they come from the hands of a good and glorious God. And it means to love Him. Fourthly, it means to expect. To kiss the Son means that you come with expectation in your heart and mind because you come to a king. Not only a king, the king of kings. It means that you rejoice in, in him with trembling and you kiss the son and you take his yoke and when you do, you expect great things. John Newton in a great old hymn, Come my soul, thy suit prepare, gives us this stanza. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such None can ever ask too much. Lord, give to Christ Pakistan. Lord, give to Christ Rhonda. Lord, use Rhonda and the Christian brothers and sisters there to reach the nations for Jesus Christ. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such. None can ever ask too much. Obey. Accept, love, expect. And I'm going to add one more to that pastor's list. Stick out your neck. Stick out your neck. Hold your neck out to receive the yoke of Christ. What does the King of kings and Lord of lords, what does he say? Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does he say? 
take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But how can it be light? Because brothers and sisters, when you stick your neck out and when you receive the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are yoked to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who has borne and is bearing the load. You're along graciously for the ride. He's the one. From cradle to cross, to empty tomb, to a throne in heaven, to one day coming again, He is doing and has done everything for those who are yoked to Him. Praise be to God. So won't you come and kiss the Son today? Won't you, individual you, Kiss the sun today. There's no refuge from the king. There is only refuge in the king. And oh, what sweet refuge it is. And if you recognize it's sweet refuge for you and for others, then brothers and sisters, you and I are much closer to those missionaries who are sticking it out in Afghanistan. And we're ready to hear the rest of the psalm. And I'm just going to summarize it. The psalmist, what does he tell us in the rest of the psalm? He tells us that that God laughs at those who mock him. God laughs at those who shake their fists at him arrogantly and foolishly. The psalmist gives us the Lord's words and they are definitive. And it's as if the cap locks are on. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And by that he means you red-faced potentates. You may think you have won. Guess what? You haven't because I've set my king on Zion. And he's the one who's reigning. He's the one who's reigning. And then the psalmist gives you the voice of that king. And he recites the promises of the Father. And he says, the nations are my heritage. That includes the United States. That includes Spain, Wales, England, Pakistan, Rwanda, and Afghanistan. They belong to Jesus Christ. They don't belong to any other ruler. And they will be his one day. And the psalmist tells us, That those who are shaking their fists at the Almighty, if they don't turn to Christ, if they don't kiss the Son, they will be dashed to pieces. The psalmist gives us a strong warning. The psalmist gives Putin a strong warning. The psalmist gives the communist leaders of China a strong warning. But what I want us all to say It's not only does he give them a warning, it's not just a, yeah, one day you're going to get it. You're going to get it for your arrogance and your foolishness and your your anger at the Almighty and for your persecution of the church. He doesn't just say, one day you're going to get it. It's not just a warning, it's a what? It's a welcome. It's a welcome. It's a royal invitation. It's a royal gospel offer. Kiss the Son. Take your refuge from God in God. And brothers and sisters, if the psalmist could do that on that side of the cross, what by God's grace and God's Spirit can we do, can you do, this side of the cross? By God's grace, you can, now the question is, will you, extend to neighbors, co-workers, friends, and family members in apex In Raleigh, throughout the world, will you extend a loving warning and welcome, kiss the sun, lest he be angry? You have an amazing opportunity. We together have an amazing opportunity. Here, in Europe, in Pakistan, and in Africa. By God's grace, let's do it. Let's pray. O Lord, our Lord, 
we ask that you would empower us, your feeble people, to go out in love, expressing words, yes, of warning, but also words of welcome. Take the yoke of Christ upon you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.